Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're, we're very thrilled to have Dan and Sharon with us. They have a rich experience in the Bible, and I know he has interesting things to say as he reflects on the where, where we are as a group of Unitarian, Biblical Unitarian believers. So, without further ado, Dan, come and address the group, please, in exactly as you will. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to you all, and it is a, uh, a pleasure to be here. And uh, I say that we occasionally have the uh, the honor and the pleasure of visiting and being here. And it's always a uh, an enjoyment to us. And we feel right at home, as we say in Tennessee, just right at home. And uh, uh, very comfortable here. And an opportunity to... Uh, to enjoy uh, one another's company and to enjoy talk about the Word and and about the one true God and His true human Son Jesus and and uh, to talk about the good things that are happening uh, the so many good things are occurring that uh, we hear reports about from uh, you folks and people are coming to this understanding. We're also experiencing some of that as well, and hear from uh, a lot of uh, of people. Sometimes, folks we never knew, never heard of, and yet uh, they're they're sending us uh, a word online, often saying, "I'm seeing this," or "I grew up, a lot, spent a lifetime as a fill in the blank," <laughs> and, but now I'm for the first time understanding about this one true God. So it's. Uh, so it's, it's exciting then, and I think that's what we, we get up for in the morning. We, we enjoy sharing, there's that word, uh, we enjoy sharing the, these wonderful things, these beautiful things of the one true God, and, uh, and to realize that it's, it's hitting home, it's, it's striking home with folks, and they too are seeing it, and enjoying these things, and benefiting from them in their faith. So, uh, so it's, it's just good. It's a good time to be alive. I know there's many difficulties and there's uh, hardships of various kinds and things going on in the world. Uh, it's a very imperfect world and difficult world at times. But it's also a good time. It's uh, at least for most of us, perhaps, many of us, in, uh, no matter what our country may be that we're in or from, we have a large degree of freedom to worship and to pursue uh, service to God and most of us uh, they won't interfere with us in that we don't have to worry so much about the knock on the door and the inquisitors and all of that sort of thing so much that doesn't mean that they uh, out there will not come against you at times and they do but the degree of freedom we have uh, is wonderful, and that to me makes it an excellent time to to be alive. It's a happy time, and uh, I think sometimes about you're studying the Book of Daniel, and that's wonderful. Uh, but I think sometimes, and you may have recently discussed it, but these fellows, Daniel and his three comrades there, and I'm sure there were many, many others, but these are folks that lost their home and were taken into a foreign land and they then uh, were in service to a foreign king as it were and uh, it was an unhappy time for them in so many ways they i'm certain they all lost family they lost others and they went through so much yeah changed their names gave them names yeah and gave them even gave them new identities as it were yeah. it's terrible uh, and yet I think about how God was with those fellows and how that God stood with Daniel and how God stood with those uh, three Hebrew children, as we yeah. say, and that God worked and blessed them wonderfully. And sometimes I think it, it wouldn't be wrong to get up some mornings and feel like we're a little bit in that, uh, in that world. We're, we're not really quite there in this wonderful kingdom that's coming. Uh, we're in still in this world, uh, and we have to wrestle with our current uh, station in life, our current circumstances. And uh, 
So, uh, but then I remember them. I remember Daniel and, uh, and those fellows, and I think, wow, God was with them in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the harshness of their circumstances. And I figure my circumstances are not as bad as theirs were. So I figure if God could get them through, and he did, then he can get me through as well. And, and uh, so I, I rejoice at that. And we're uh, largely free to, uh, to come to this one true God, serve him from our hearts, do the Shema, isn't this wonderful? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, and to be happy and pleased with the, the true Son of God, the true human Son of God, the Anointed One, uh, and uh, the Christ. So I'm just happy. I'm very, uh, very pleased and, and happy about all of that. I think uh, it's wonderful to me to see you folks and to see you meeting here and there are others, but I think and some of you that are out there in internet land, as it were, who are participating in this, and uh, I uh, uh, encourage you to meet together. If you can't physically be here, then by all means do what you're doing. Tune in, check in because we really do need one another. And that's so important. I don't think uh, God really intends for us to go it alone. He, he wants his people to be together, to hang together, to, to work together, to share their mutual faith and bear one another up. <clears throat> and uh, so I think what you're doing is so wonderful and so important and uh, and I think the fact that you're doing it in pursuit of truth, in pursuit and, and upholding this understanding about the one true God is a marvelous, wonderful, amazing, and important. Uh, I think uh, sometimes we, we must remember that what we're doing is important. It's important to God, and it's important to uh, the Christ, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, one of my favorite verses earlier on in my life, when I was a young fellow, came to be uh, 1 John 1 and 7. And uh, John has just been talking about that God is light and in him dwells no darkness at all and how wonderful that is. And uh, uh, I suppose then that we probably usually can't say that that uh, there is no darkness ever in us. That we, but the goal would be to be like him and to be filled with that light, uh, his light. And, uh, but I thought about uh, in verse 7, John says this. He says, you know, if we walk in the light, so there's a conditional. It's, an, it's important if we walk in the light. So John's not talking about if you don't want to walk in the light. He's talking about those who will. And he says, if we walk in the light as he, and he's talking about God there, uh, the Father, as he is in the light, then, and notice these next words, then we have fellowship mm. with one another. So I think that's illuminating to me. I think, wow. Uh, my uh, my dad, who is uh, who is uh, deceased, but he came to see so many wonderful things, and he said, "You know," he said, "fellowship really isn't just a choice we get to make." He said, "The fellowship that we hold is laid out for us. The terms of it are laid out for us." And he said, even in that very verse, mm -hmm. "If we walk in light, like." God is in light, then we have fellowship with one another. So I know uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, people to walk together if they're not in agreement, uh, but the key, it would seem, for uh, the Christians of the New Testament was walk in light as God is in light, and then we have fellowship one with another. And mm, fellowship, that means something. Fellowship that's important. So the, the true fellowship, the fellowship that God would have us to maintain, 
uh, is with others who are walking in light. And uh, mind you, if, if folks, if folks are, are coming along and walking along the way in light and they're doing what they can see and learn and uh, as God shines light in their pathway, they walk there. Uh, that's a wonderful, amazing thing. But if, if people are not going to walk in light, it's very difficult then to have fellowship and freedom of fellowship with people who either are sometimes even opposing light. That's awful. Uh, and, uh, but uh, for those who walk in the light, and I think that becomes a lifelong experience. I think uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Greek word of there, I think, is peripateo, peripateo, walking around, if you will, in a way. Uh, those who walk in light go about their lives, go about their business, uh, their activities, their worship in light then they're going to have fellowship with one another as they do that. So uh, it's, it's uh, very difficult then not to. Here's what I've learned though. Walking in light, I think, is a progression. God will shine light in our path. Uh, we know Psalm 119 and 105, where that the psalmist says, uh, you know, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So the word of God is pictured as light. And I think that that carries well. God is light. In him is no darkness. The words he speaks then, you can equate that to light for our paths. And uh, I think the psalmist did all he knew and could do in Psalm 119 and 105 and he was happy about all of that, and yet the psalmist did not enjoy the benefit of all of the truth and light and understanding that came by Jesus Christ. Uh, we think about how great it was for, for that psalmist and the things he was writing, and that's true. But I think perhaps he would trade places uh, to be able to have a chance to be where we're at. They, back there many times, they were just straining to look at the things we now see quite clearly. And uh, so that's wonderful. But walking in light is a progression, and it's important. I think you need to be on a, in a forward motion regarding this business of walking in light, not looking back. Uh, there's no place for looking. For everybody who's moving forward in light and understanding, then yeah, that's we can fellowship, we can gain ground together, and and uh, and so it is. But the person who won't walk in light, or like I say, even fights against light, my goodness, what would that be? Um, and uh, doesn't get it, then for those folks, fellowship is not so easy. Uh, it's not. It's easy for. Uh, light to fellowship with light, but not for light to fellowship with darkness. Uh, it seems like uh, a point that Paul was bringing out. What, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Not really. So my dad was right. Keep ourselves from the world. Like, oh, yes. Away from everybody. Yeah, yeah well, there you go. Can't do that not, they're not in that sense. That's right. Which doesn't let our light shine in the world. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we're to be lights to the world by holding forward, holding forth yeah. this word of life. Yeah, so I, I like, mm -hmm. I like it a lot. But, uh, but anyway, as my life has gone along for me, I've realized two things. Then, walking in understanding as God shines light in our paths is wonderful. And uh, uh, I think uh, the second thing is fellowship with others who are doing that same thing is very wonderful, valuable, and important. So, uh, so I enjoy uh, the fellowship, and I enjoy the time we spend together, and I enjoy that fellowship. And notice it's even a further issue there in John, 1 John 1 and 7. Uh, he says, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, 
it looks to me like that's also covered under that, under that uh, uh, if we walk in the light. It's under that conditional. So, uh, wow, then how serious is walking in the light? It turns out to be very important. And when we see people who are saying, oh, why does that matter? Or what do you, you know, what's, that's no big deal. That's really not so, I think. Uh, and uh, I've always thought, you know, if, if God, and God shined a lot of light, thankfully, on my pathway since those early years, uh, when I first uh, began thinking about this passage. But God shined a lot of light. I've always wanted to walk in whatever light, true light, he brings to me. Uh, not imaginary light, that doesn't help anything. But real light, true light, by his word, I've always wanted to walk in it because I figured, hey, if God went to the trouble to bring this word and shine this light in my life, I want to walk in that. Otherwise, why would I expect him to shine more light? I mean, I'm not walking in what he gave me. So I would think that kind of hangs up this whole thing right there. If I won't walk in the light God has shined to me, and I resist that or reject it or oppose it for whatever reasons I may have, then I don't foresee that God's going to say, well, you didn't like that. I'll give you some different light. I don't think that's the plan. God is the one who's shining light in our path. And I think it's so important that we walk in that. And, well, conditions, yeah. If we walk in the light, we go about our lives in light, then we have fellowship with others who are walking in light. That works really good. And the blood of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. cleanses those people from all sin. Now, the people that want to walk in darkness or can't quite get the understanding that light is important, then I don't know if they have that promise that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all sin. Those who walk in light, they do have that promise. When we err, when we make mistakes, we have uh, the confidence to know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So it's a wonderful thing, and I'm, I think uh, I'm not going to take uh, time today uh, because I know you're into this wonderful study in Daniel, and I love all of that. Uh, so happy you're, you're doing that. And, uh, but I just wanted to share with you those thoughts, the importance of what we do and the importance of what we're doing in the Word. It, it's very significant. It's not just uh, some sort of brain exercise. It's not just some, something where that we're, we're doing it so we can tell other people, we're right and you're wrong. It's not quite that. It goes beyond all of that. It actually comes to pleasing God. It comes to walking in His light. And it comes to being cleansed from all sin by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. So walk in light. Never be afraid. And, uh, and walk with others who have that same heart and same attitude. So that's all I wanted to mention to you this morning. God bless you all and carry on and we'll look forward to this and that. I'm enjoying the new Keegan Chandler book. Just got it recently. So uh, that's exciting now. And we have that going on. But uh, the Lord bless you all. And uh, it's really an honor to be here. If you're in Nashville or thereabouts anytime, come and see us. You'll always be welcome. And, uh, and God bless you all. Thank you. Okay. All right, 1 John 1, 7, that's wonderful. I think we as Unitarians perhaps have not stressed the blood and the water that came out of the side of Jesus. Isn't that remarkable? When they stuck a sword in, in his side, out came blood and water. Why? Because these are cleansing agents, both water and blood. We've not done enough of that. I think we need to do more at our conference even. We have not talked about no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. So all of those sacrifices were pointing to the great sacrifice. We need to develop that more. We also need to develop the presence of the kingdom. We're very settled on the future kingdom. That's wonderful. We should. We've got the gospel of the kingdom. We've got that. However, if that's just something, well, out there, won't that be great? And it doesn't impact our lives now with energy. I'm not talking boring doctrines, not arguing doctrines. I'm talking about Christian living. So the devil has a great trick going. He says, well, give me Christian living. I'll have a better marriage. All of that's wonderful. I need to be a better person. All of that's wonderful. 
However, the doctrines are not boring doctrines, they are the life. And that's where Sam, uh, Steve Ahn, you know, our Korean pastor, loves John 6, 63, which says, the words that I speak to you, Jesus speaking, the words that I speak to you are spirit. Isn't that marvelous? Are. It's a very intense way of saying that they're the essence of something. Right? God is love does not mean God is an emotion. God is light doesn't mean that God is one to one equal to light. It means that God is full of light. God is full of love, right? So the word was God in John 1, there, the word was God, means that God, the word was full of God. You are what you say. The word is the expression of you and it's the expression of God. That's a very intense way of saying it. That eternal life, Jesus said in 17.3 of John, is, right? What he means is the way to eternal life, the way of gaining immortality. And it's good to say the life of the age to come because that's what that means. Gradually we can impact people with that phrase where, the, where it's appropriate to do it. The life of the coming kingdom, the life of the age to come, is to be tasted now. So just following on what Dan was saying there, I think, I think that's most important. If I could comment on God is yep. light, a mm -hmm. lot of people are commenting here Good. about God being light. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no darkness. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, on the heels of this uh, onslaught, <laughs> as you called it yesterday, there's a nice symmetry here in, in, G in Jesus' words in John 8, 12, yeah. where it says, I am the light. Wait a minute, God is light. <laughs> Jesus ah, said, I am the light. There you go, Pops, you're awesome. <laughs> there you go. But then in Matthew 5, 14, as you know, you, are the light, Jesus right. says, are the light. And does this, again, we come back to the fellowship, Dan, Pastor Dan, about the oneness that there is with mm -hmm. the church, mm -hmm. with all of us, or there should be, of one mind, one spirit. We are the light, Jesus is the light, God is the light. We, we are the salt of the earth, and yes. so, so it's this nice Great. fellowship, spiritual oneness. Marvelous. Makes good sense. It also says in Daniel 2.22 that light dwells with God. I like that. Mm -hmm. The word was with God. And somebody tossed out a mistranslation yesterday. said, yeah, the word was face to face with God. It doesn't say that. It's not a person with another person. That was tossed out. No, light dwells with God. The word dwells with God. You are what you think. You are what you say. I, I love that. So love those are emphases we need to, to make constantly. I love the... Um the equation that that verse 7 presents to us, if, then. And you have that yes. repeated, that if-then sequence in nine, yes. I mean 8, 9, and 10. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me how very often the scriptures are conditioned. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> wow, yeah. If we claim yes. to be sinless, if we confess our sins, oh, well, if yeah. we claim we are not sinned, mm -hmm. a lot of ifs there. Yeah. <laughs> That's very, very good. That makes the once saved, always saved, what Sean Finnick called OSAS, an absolute falsehood. A complete falsehood. Put up your hand to get saved, wouldn't matter if you robbed a bank every day of the week for the rest of your life, you still get to know. Still get to heaven. It's false. Paul says, if we remain in the or Jesus said, if we remain in the truth, then we're doing well. And if we can go to the end of the line in the parable of the sower, I mean, these are fundamental, systematic mistakes in the system out there. So we need well, you got this idea that God has to, yeah. right? Well, you gave your life to Jesus, yeah. God, once. Sure. He's got to deliver you. He's got to save you. Yeah. God, God has... We have our part to do. God uh, exactly. doesn't have to do anything. Two weeks. <laughs> no, God to. said, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> keep he keeps yeah. saying, God, you know, you have to, yeah. you know, put in your own heart, but... That's, that's that Jeremiah 27 verse that we keep coming back to. Is it 27.5? I think so. Yeah. If you want to know, I, mean, I don't hear this preached a lot. I say to the students at the college, you need to preach this every Sunday six times. By that I'm saying people don't know. You'd be amazed what they don't know out there. They haven't got enough of the high octane words of God coursing in their blood to give them energy. So Jeremiah 27.5 is marvelous. It says, I, God, you feel God, you can say this, you know. I've made the heavens and the earth and I've made all the animals on the earth, and I'm going to give that world of animals and human beings to the one who is pleasing in my sight, or it may be translated equally well, it doesn't matter, I'll give it to the one that seems fit to me to give it to. Wow! That's a generous God. How about owning the world? We'll get to that in Daniel 7 in a moment. I didn't learn this in church. I learned that vaguely, if I was a good chap, didn't kick the cat, was kind to Aunt Bessie, didn't swear too much, then I would go to heaven when I died. It's false. That's a way to poison yourself, put cyanide 
in your coffee, thanks to our <laughs> French friend here. No cyanide. You want truth, you want energy, you want falsehood, you want poison. Don't do it. Anything we believe that's false is not actually helping us in any way. You know, that, that Jeremiah one is very interesting because he just keep reading mm -hmm. verse 7. Yes. And we'll read in Daniel 7 yes. almost verbatim. Good point. What it says in verse 7, I just saw it. And all nations shall, shall serve <coughs> Nebu and his son. That's right. And his son's son. Yes. Until the time comes. But that all nations shall, mm -hmm. shall serve him. Yes. We'll see in Daniel 7. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. 20, it all ties together. That's what the Jews called a, a couple of Hebrew words, Gezar Shawah. They said, the rabbi said, look, you've got a, a phrase over here. Ooh, that reminds me of that phrase. Put it together, string the pearls, join the dots. That's Bible study. And when you don't do that, when you pull it all apart, well, you say, well, we don't believe in water baptism because there's only one baptism, you see. This is the story. We're, we're getting this day by day. And it's quite ang anger-making in a way. You have to be very patient. But there's a whole trend out there that says that water baptism doesn't count because there's only one baptism in the spirit. Wait a minute, that's just false. Every lexicon knows it's false. Every commentary I said to the students in every language for 2,000 years knows that's wrong. Baptism is simple obedience because Jesus said get baptized. Paul said get baptized. So they came up with this idea this week. I've seen it before. These are ex-way people. I'm going to name ex-way people. They're saying... You're going to name names. Got to name names to make it clear to people, unfortunately. And they're saying, well, Peter made a mistake, didn't he? That's what they're actually, you, you wouldn't believe this. Oh, yes. People will go to any mad length to deny the evident truth that's before them if they're going to do that. So in Acts 10, you know, Cornelius is the first Gentile actually to be baptized there. Among the first ones, some in, in Acts 8 too, the Samaritans were, were Gentiles too. But Cornelius, that marvelous story of how God guided them all affected their lives in such a dramatic way. And Peter then finally said, who can prevent water? You hear that word water? Let's argue about the word water. Let's not. <laughs> who can prevent water so that I can baptize them? That's <clears throat> baptism in water. It is. And then in chapter 11, when they had been baptized in water, Peter said, and then I remembered that John the Baptist said something about, well, I'm baptizing in water, but Jesus is going to baptize in spirit. So whoops, I made a mistake. That is Bible study at its worst. Alas, these are Unitarian friends of ours. Let's not tear the faith apart at an easy level like that. That's just wrong. Just yes. comment. What do we got? Yeah, well, we have um, yeah. two things. I mean, there's several things here, but um, this one, and then there's another one. I'm okay. To, okay. Um, but this okay. is about the light. This is, made, this yes. is from L.G. Douglas. Mm -hmm. Lance. That's the Lance. Lance that is okay. in Canton, north of Atlanta. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. He says, may my eyes be open to the narrow path that God lights before me, yes. and my ears open to hear the teachings of yes. God's word, yes. filling me with wisdom to turn from the shadows. Very good. Yes. Good. That's wonderful. Yeah, no, that's, that's well put. He has a, a ministry, I think, with that, with that uh, natural gift of language, then that could be used. That'd be wonderful. And... Um, our uh, brother Ramon, where, yes. where is Ramon? Ramon is in Michigan, I believe. Indiana. Oh, Indiana. Indiana, Indiana. Indiana. okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, he says he's been struggling with um, doubt yes. due to his wife's kidney disease. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, I mean, this is a real life For all of us. situation mm -hmm. that many people Absolutely. deal with. Absolutely. For all yeah. of us. Ramon's yes. been away for a while, so he's back. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're very, 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 very glad to see yeah, you. Yeah. And, and we certainly sympathize that. We don't say glibly, well, you know, God heals all diseases, so big joke, and you know, just pray in God. It doesn't work that way. We don't have apostles like the twelve. This is what I tell the students. You have to have seen Jesus to be an apostle. You have to have seen him. You haven't. You cannot be an apostle with the accrediting signs and wonders of an apostle. That's clear. <coughs> However, God can do miracles. We know that. How he does them, when he does them, isn't entirely clear to me. Supposing God, as he says in Isaiah twice, I've been silent for a long time. I've been in, has, he, in some ways he has been, I think. Otherwise, you snap your fingers, you know, call the elders and they, they anoint and, and everybody. It doesn't work that way. So we have great sympathy, I think, for that that issue. It's, it's something that faces us all. None of us has a perfect explanation of all that, I think. Also, uh, anyway, what else? Comment. Yes, um, so after you said, um, <coughs> sorry to hear that Ramon is hard when our loved ones are sick. Mm. Um, 
she has been dealing this for the last three years. Right. So I think some of her doubting, maybe yes. you know, sometimes you doubt oh, that prayers can be answered absolutely. if God is even listening. Absolutely. He doesn't specify the doubts, but right. it's easy to see yeah. what, what that would yeah. be. Mm -hmm. um, Corey, uh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis says, simple obedience has been around since the garden. Yes. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, yes. simple. Yes. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Yes. Simple. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that didn't have to do with the sickness of Corey says Ramon I hope this helps but this is what a few followers of Christ said after being nearly beaten to death through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom Excellent. of God mm -hmm. that is tough that's a refrigerator verse right 1422 of Acts through much tribulation we are destined to enter the kingdom there's a place there in Acts in John 6 you know where the apostles say this is hard stuff you know the stuff about bread coming down from heaven and eating the bread and drinking the blood this is this is really tough and so they almost threaten to leave don't they some of them do leave jesus did not keep all of his audience you know that some of this is beyond us we're out of here and then he says you can see messiah turning to peter say, are you going to leave too and peter's answer is brilliant though. he says where else are we going to go you have the words of the life of the age to come I love that. You, Jesus, have the word, the word, the word, the words. Oh, he just died for my sins and rose. That's fine. We know that. We should believe that with passion. But the teachings of Messiah, if you read uh, the 12th chapter of John, at the end of the public ministry of John, should be read very often, the 12th chapter, verse 44 and onwards. He raises his voice. We had a man come and preach to us one Sunday who went through all the passages where Jesus actually shouted. But he lifts this one out. It's kind of interesting. He happened to leave this one out, but in John, John 12, 44, following, he, ra he shouts, presumably pulling out all the stops, right? Underlining in red, refrigerator verses and all that stuff. He says, if you don't listen to what I'm saying, you're dead, effectively. Because the words that I'm speaking are God's words. And they were incensed yesterday because I said, I believe in two saviors. I believe God's a savior. I believe that Jesus is a savior too at different levels. One of them is God and one's the, the human saviour. And then there were saviours in the book of Nehemiah also. They're saviours. Oh, they said, how could you possibly have two saviours for eternal life? That just drove them crazy. They didn't like it. So anyway, it's the words, the words of Jesus, isn't it? Uh, you're aware of the text, the most threatening text of all. Probably not a refrigerator text, like you don't put God is a consuming fire on your fridge, mostly. You put the Lord is my shepherd. But there's the text where Jesus said, multitudes will say to me, in my translation, Lord, Lord, look what we did for you in church. Look at the things we did in church, God. Look at the miracles. Then he turns to them rather sadly. I never recognized you. What? That's very challenging. That's an awful verse, isn't it? I think we're on the right track. I'm sure we have faults and all that, but I think we're... Because the Bible is so vibrant and alive now, where in my Church of England days it meant nothing at all, something has happened to make this a compelling document. Okay, so anyway, very good on 1 John 1, 7. That's good. The light that we walk in. And if we do that, then the blood of Messiah cleanses and purifies us from all sin. Ramon has asked me to say that um, he said that he... He wrote to you, I lost wherever it is, mm -hmm. but he said he wrote to you this week. He did. And that you responded with love and oh. uh, Truth. truths. Oh, good. And well, says, yeah. Please thank you. So. Well, no, that's very sweet. I mean, I, I wanted him to know he's not alone. We all of us say, oh God, where are you? Don't we? David said that. You know that about 70% of the Psalms are David complaining to God. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Look, they're, they're called Psalms of Lament. Oh my God, this is awful. Where are you? Help me. I'm lost, you know. So you're not alone to feel. We all feel that. Uh, he's in some church maybe that is telling him that yes. if you don't have enough faith. That's right. You know, in other words, if you're not healed, right. it's because you yeah. don't have that's enough faith. That's right. No. No. That's, that's, not good. That's, a, that's an extreme form of Pentecostal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're sick and depressed. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, you're not healed, you're ill. Well, Where's your faith? You know faith, so you're sick. I mean, the Apostle Paul, we know he had some, he some health, issue, health, some health health issue. His eyes or something. Did not get healed. Right. Right. Yeah, did not get healed. Pray to Jesus, but Jesus said, no, my grace is in Yep, I know. That, that is tough. I, I, nobody's suggesting the Bible is an easy book. It's not. It's for the tough. Because if you're going to rule the world, I mean, 
Americans in particular, I say this as a green card person, I don't get to vote in this marvelous thing you're doing right now. I don't have to vote, I don't get to vote. But if you're planning to rule the world and choosing your government, wouldn't you want to watch those people before you put them in place? That takes us into Daniel and Joseph. You know those bright boys, probably 18 year olds, the three, who were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. That Nebuchadnezzar was a smart guy. He was also so arrogant that he had to be put down, and that's a great lesson for all of us. Do not be arrogant, especially when you're young. Don't do it, because justice is going to strike. But here, Nebuchadnezzar could see those three men were brilliant people. So he gave them the best education, right? They were learned in all the Chaldean literature, trained them up. And guess what? Daniel became what? The third ruler over the province of Babylon. Those Jews were brilliant people. Jesus was a brilliant person. Is it for no good reason that God entrusted the oracles of God to the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews, I was telling you. Yesterday. Jesus was a Jew. Oh no, they just said, no, he was a Judean. He wasn't a Jew. That's what we got. A Jew, what, excuse me? Oh, in other words, I don't like what you just said, so I'm gonna divert and quibble with some silly thing about the words. Come on, that's just silly. Jesus was a Jew from the tribe of Judah. That's a Jew for me. And so that's very easy. Daniel was a Jewish person, uh, obviously. He was about 90 at the end of the book, by the way. He had a long life. And he was sought after by the government of that time. Joseph, likewise. Joseph was almost head of the whole of Egypt. Only in the throne, it says, was he second, right? Why? Because these were brilliant people. And if you get the mind of Jesus, you are actually floating above all the nonsense. Do you, do you realize that? You're in a very strong position after a while. The older you get, the more you're walking in the truth. All of this fighting about doctrines is really quite childish, actually. Just the last word for yes. Ramon. Uh, what does Ramon say? You know, Peter, yes. first Peter 1, mm -hmm. he says, we're more precious than gold. That's very good. And if you're yes. more precious than gold, yes. you're going to be refined. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Worse. Yeah. Than, than Absolutely. gold is refined, because, you know, yeah. gold, you got to melt it and so on. Yeah. And they says the object yeah. is that your faith yes. may be found for praise, glory, and honor. honor. That's right. That's in 1 Peter 1, 7. It's a terrific verse. We haven't done enough of that. The precious blood of Christ is more valuable than, than anything we can imagine. And if you get this right, then you are going to be praised. And so I've worked against the idea of, oh, poor little me, if I could just hold the door for a thousand years, I'll be happy. No, you won't. That's to underestimate your talent. Who gave you the talent? God did, right? If God wants to put you in charge of a few places or cities, well done, you. Oh, well done, Jesus. I get that. <laughs> I see that. I understand the well done, Jesus part. But what about well done, you, good and faithful servant? You're done good. I have to lay on my Georgia appalling, what I laughingly call my Georgia accent, to get people's attention because it's so bad. It's absolutely grates on their ears. You're done good. You done good. I know Jesus did. I, I, that I understand. Well done, good and faithful servant. servant. And that First Peter 1 7 is mistranslated in some versions because they don't like this idea that you are going to get praise and glory and honor. You. I can accept that. So be it. God wants that. Let him do it. Let God do what he wants to do. Back to Jeremiah 27 5. All of this came out of Dan's sermon, by the way. See, blame him for all of this. <laughs> <That's terrible. Sorry. laughs> it's wonderful stuff. It was all John. Uh, <laughs> it's all John. <laughs> He's giving credit to John. That's, That's entirely right. right. Okay. So let's move then into the territory of. Uh, actually, yeah. before we do that, I just want to mention John 5:24, along these lines. I think we need to concentrate on the presence of the eternal life, the life of the age to come. The presence of it, not only the future. The future is excellent, but in John 5:24. Listen to these words. Amen, I'm telling you, with the utmost emphasis I'm telling you, Jesus said. He who hears my word, that's the condition. You've got to hear the gospel now. That's not just the Bible. Most people say, got the word of God here, false. Got the words of God, yes. Scripture, yes. But within that, you've got the in-house technical term for the gospel of the kingdom, which is underlying everything. So everybody who gets to hear my gospel of the kingdom and believes him who sent me, I love that. Not even believe in. I mean, obviously, you have to believe in God. But you're supposed to believe. This is the way we operate. Down here, I have a bridge that was taken away in the middle of the night one time, an extreme rain. So I got on the bridge there, and I said, this is my faith story on the bridge. That bridge, I want to tell you, which is 
three and a half, four, four tons, actually Tom here was involved in putting that up for us. It's very, very heavy. In the middle of the night, about 10 years ago, it was removed and taken away. Anthony, you're lying. No, why would I lie? We're supposed to believe each other. Now, I know people lie, but God doesn't lie. So if God, through Jesus, says something, you believe it. Remember that? What happened to Zechariah when he didn't believe what the angel said? Struck down. Dangerous. So I love that text, 524. He who believes the one who sent me and speaks through me, Jesus is saying there, has, note the present, has the life of the age to come, has eternal life. You haven't got it, but you've got it. Can you handle that? This is a nice paradox. You've got it, but you haven't got it. You've got it as a down payment in terms of spirit, but you ain't seen nothing yet. You get spirit on a massive scale when you are immortalized. You're not immortal now because you can be shot, but you've got the down payment of eternal life in 524 and doesn't come into judgment. How about that? You've crossed the sound barrier, right? The death thing is gone. You are potentially immortal now. That should have you very much a happy person, shouldn't it? Despite all the problems. But that's what Jesus clearly said there. He has passed from eternal life and doesn't come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. It's amazing. Isn't it? Okay, enough of that. That all came out of First John 1 7 and related topics. Now, Daniel 7. We've seen six marvelous chapters of Daniel. De Jesus loved the book of Daniel, he loved it. So don't ever say anything critical about Daniel because you're criticizing Jesus. And we've seen some of that happen. Alas, Daniel is the prophet Daniel. There's a whole host of scholarship out there which absolutely doesn't believe a word of it. No, Daniel is not a prophet. He just made it up and so on. That is false and poisonous. So Daniel chapter 7, you're going to like this one because it will remind you of the second chapter. And I will tell you perhaps flatly, I don't, I don't know exactly what these kingdoms are. We can, we can ex explore it, but in chapter 2, you've got the head, you know, which is gold, and you've got the next one down is what? The silver, and then the bronze, right in chapter 2, just referring back to chapter 2, you've got the bronze, the third one, and then you've got this awful fourth thing, which is the toes, which are iron. This may be a repeat of that, on the other hand, it may not be, and the point there would be that in chapter 7, it says these are four kingdoms, which are going to arise. Did you see that there? Which verse is that, Sarah, for me? In Daniel 7, these are four kingdoms which will arise. Which verse is that? My eye doesn't fall on it. Sarah will find it for me. She's my verse finder. 17. 17. These great beasts, which are listed when we get to read, this is Daniel, chapter 7, verse 17. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings or kingdoms who are going to rise from the earth. Well, what year is he speaking in? Go back to 7 1, the first year of Belshazzar. This is right close to the end of the Babylonian Empire. So it may be, and I say maybe, that these are four kingdoms to appear in the Middle East in the end times. That's possible. Maybe they're right there sitting in front of us. I'm not sure, but I'll leave that open because that future tense t seems to suggest that they are future to the time of the vision, verse 17 being key. These four great beasts, four in number, are four kings or kingdoms, empires, who will arise from the earth. So I, I just throw that out to you. It, I don't think we have to understand every word of all the prophets. <coughs> we can still look for more light. Okay, chapter 7, I'll read verse 1, if I may, from the New American Standard Version. Any translation would be fine. And I'll ask Sarah to do verse 2. 7, 1 of Daniel. In the first year of Belshazzar, about 553 BC, first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind, in his heart, in his head, as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down, and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first, a lion, eagle's wings. While I watched, the wings were plucked, it was raised from the ground to stand on two feet, 
like a human being and given a human mind. Mm -hmm. That's and, fine. and behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, it was raised up on one side, it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour, devour much flesh. Mm -hmm. Verse 6. After this, I looked and behold another like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on his back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great. Okay, so that's, that's good. It's very clear that that last part is the worst, isn't it? And that does correspond with the second chapter too, the iron and the toes. So there is a correspondence, but if if these are the same four chapters, I don't, I don't know, I'm leaving that open. It may be, the problem might be then that 17th verse which says these are four kingdoms which shall arise. If you take that as a literal future tense, then that's difficult because Babylon was about to fall when he said this. So leave that open. But what is very clear to me, there's a tenfoldness about the last one, right? The last one is the one that really interests us. There's a tenfoldness about it, but there's something else. What else is there in addition to ten? An eleventh one. And this is a real... Well, the three horns were taken away. And there are three taken away. So you've got, a, you've got 11 plus minus 3, you've got 8 eventually, but you've got 10 plus 1 minus 3, you've got 8 standing. <laughs> that's, that's the end part. Really? No, <laughs> this, the, this I you can get on my calculator. Yeah. <laughs> the tenfold is interesting because you all know without turning to it, and in Revelation 17, Jesus comes back and destroys 10 kings. So, the book of Revelation, of course, is part of this whole thing. You know this. The book of Revelation is massive Daniel stuff. It's an interpretation of Daniel. Well, if you can just fix this one thing in your mind, the last evil kingdom before the second coming and, and the kingdom of God is a tenfold thing, plus an eleventh one on the side who, te who is also a beast. He's, a, he's the beast. The whole thing is the beast. But there's an individual who represents that kingdom who is also the beast. So it's ten plus one minus three. Uh, that's the picture you get. That's fixed because in Revelation, where I won't turn because it will be too much, it says clearly that these ten kings are going to fight Jesus at his coming. So that whatever this final wicked thing is, it's a tenfolded thing with an antichrist on the side who represents the ten and he's worse than all of them. With eyes like a man, he's, he's a ferocious person. One could name certain individuals in history, even within my lifetime, when one gets that sort of reminiscence, you know, of terrifying individuals with flashing eyes who did enormous amounts of harm. So just think of the tenfoldedness of the last one. Now you can either take these as the same kingdoms as chapter 2, or you could say there still has to be in the Middle East. And here's the point I think is significant. Most prophecy students were taught that Rome was the fourth kingdom. We tend to say that because we look at Rome and we think that's a bad guy. And no doubt there are parallels. You can certainly say that. Roman system was very cruel. You can. Whether that's actually exactly what's being talked about is another question because the scene is Babylon here. Nebuchadnezzar, Medo-Persia, headquarters in Babylon. Greece, Alexander the Great, headquarters in Babylon. The likely is not a European thing. Probably not. Doesn't matter. That's where, where people were. Probably not that. Probably a Middle Eastern thing, all centered even with the possibility of commercial Babylon being rebuilt. That's a possibility. Uh, people at Dallas Theological Seminary have written books on this even. And Henry Alford, the great expositor, said, you know, Babylon in Revelation is a commercial thing. It is. There's a whole lot of traders who, when it's destroyed, are weeping. It's a commercial Where is the site of Babylon today? Babylon exactly? is exactly five miles, uh, well, it's near to, to Baghdad, isn't it? Five miles south. Uh, a little place called Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. -L -L -E -L. It's in Iraq. It's in Iraq. 
And it's, it's a possibility. Jeremiah spends 10 chapters on Babylon. And guess what? All of that's quoted in the book of Revelation. So it depends a lot with what you do with the word Babylon in Revelation, because it's the scene of all those prophecies in Jeremiah. And you can certainly say that Babylon originally was chaos, wasn't it? The Tower of Babylon, you see, that's what it is. Not the Tower of Babel. It is, but it isn't. Same word. It's the Tower of Babylon. All confusion comes out of Babylon, and it seems to be in the system all the way through. It may culminate and climax in a final commercial, political commercial venture. That's possible because of the richness of the oil. Oil is everything, right? And it's very rich in oil. So are we looking at a time when, and here I throw this in, you know that Saddam Hussein was building his own palace there. You know that. He said, I'm the new Nebuchadnezzar. He said that. And he took he's the, quite dead. Right? He's quite dead. So it turned out that it wasn't he, but it could be another of his type as possible. So you keep these as options, you know, and wait and see what happens. Okay, the rest of it's fairly straightforward then. The lion and the, the, the plucking of the wings reminds you of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it, also? You know, he had his terrible arrogance, and he was cut down from that arrogance, and made into a beast for a while, claws, and eventually he was given a human mind. He recovered. It reminds you a little bit of that. doesn't mean it's exactly the same event, but it's like it. Then another beast, the second one in verse 5, a bear. People say, well, the Russian bear, possible. I, you know, it's not, not fixed, but it, it's like a bear, that one. Or will be, either was or will be. Verse 6, I kept looking, and another one, the third one, like a leopard, uh, had four wings. It has a fourfoldness about it, this uh, penultimate kingdom, the one before the end. And four heads, so lots of fours there. And then I saw this ghastly thing, which shows up in the book of Revelation. And then there's a little horn, and I'm quite sure the little horn in chapter in verse 8 here is the same as in chapter 8. You've got a similar little horn. It seems that those two little horns are the same Antichrist figure. And there are people who say, well, there's no future Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is all there is. That actually, frankly, is wrong. John says, you've heard, this is 1 John 2.18, 1 John 2.18, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. And then he said, but there are many Antichrists, plural, already. The one doesn't exclude the other. People say, oh, well, it's just the spirit of Antichrist has been around. That's certainly right. And that was probably the fake Jesus that replaced the true one. However, he didn't deny the first premise. You've heard that anti antichristos antichrist as a title is coming that's not wrong everybody knew that there would be a final antichrist and for many years because people thought the final pope and all of that i think it's probably better not to try to label the pope you know that doesn't make any friends <coughs> wait and see but there is a final antichrist first john 2 18. he's coming and he would be the little horn then in chapter 7 and chapter 8 along with 10 so the tenfoldness and then an eleventh evil guy. He has the eyes of a man in verse 8 <coughs> and uh, possesses eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great boast. The great danger is pride which comes before a fall. So that's a lesson for all of us. Don't let's get to think we are more than we should. Let everybody assess his own capacity and be so happy with that because boastful didn't get him anywhere this one. Just go back to the Antichrist <laughs> yeah. reference in Absolutely. First John. Yeah. You don't worry. Read really? yes. Um, Please. Dear friends, this is the last hour. Mm -hmm. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Mm -hmm. In addition, this is your uh, version. In addition, many yeah. have already appeared. Yes. And this sure. is how we know this is the last hour. Yeah. So it's very immediate, right? Right. These people left us. Yes. So they were, he's talking about Christians. Yes. So Secessionists, they were people ostensibly of the true group, and they, they left, they, they went out there. And then he goes on to say, it proves that they really weren't of us, right? The fact that they left suggests that they really weren't with us. He's been kind. So you can only be an antichrist yeah. if you were somehow associated yeah, with Christ in the yeah. first place. Yeah, right? that's, that's what it's it not an atheist or a gnostic. No. no. Anyway, the doctor. Yeah. And, and Antichrist, or like the spirit of Antichrist, but the yes. Antichrist, we don't think is going to have to have been a Christian. 
I don't well, know. That's I don't a good know. question. It's possible. Actually. It's possible. I, I, I don't know. know. I, I think that happened. The Antichrist. Well, certainly he's, the type of symbol. He doesn't worship any God, right? Yes. He, he's, whatever he is finally, whether he came out of the church, the true church or not, he, he's an atheist by the time he gets there. Well, he's, a, he's a worshiper of false God, isn't he? Well, see, this, but you bring up a good point because it says uh, that these people who were Christians yeah. had the spirit of that yeah. one yeah. Antichrist. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I don't wait and see. Uh, there, there are lots of impenetrable things in scripture. You just simply don't know. So, well, that's fine. Of course, yeah. maybe. But I'm, I'm so quite sure, however, it's wrong to get into the future. The spirit of right. yeah, The spirit of Antichrist was rampant right there. And I think it developed into the whole system, which is laced with that spirit. But there is the Antichrist as well. There's no article That's in the, the Greek, but it's a title. You've heard that Antichristos is coming. Of course, they knew that. Everybody knew about the final king of the yeah. north they in Daniel 11. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That wasn't denied. But sometimes in Bible study, people was, were unca incapable of thinking of both and, right? Like the kingdom is present in some sense. It's future in a different sense. Both things are correct in different senses. So that's probably the idea there. Then it gets easier now. <laughs> Verse 9, who's going to do 9 for us? <laughs> yes, oh yes, it gets easier. Verse 9. Daniel 7. Anthony. Oh, me, I kept looking. He's lying on his bed, seeing the street. I kept looking. Oh. Until thrones, plural, were set up. Royalty. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. I continued to watch, because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. Mm -hmm. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed, mm -hmm. and its body was destroyed by fire. As for the rest, their dominion had been taken away, mm -hmm. yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Yeah. Okay, let's stop right there. I, know, I don't know what that means at the end. Somehow the kingdoms are destroyed, but their life is prolonged. I have to wait and see. Maybe you know what that is. What is very clear to me is that the Ancient of Days would have to be God himself. He's like a judge. Our judges today... Do they have wigs? You see, the, it comes straight out of here. He's the ultimate judge. So this chaos comes to an end until thrones are set up, plural, and God the Father, ancient of days, took his seat. So we're all facing judgment. The lesson for all of us here is that we're going to be judged by the words of Jesus, which are the words of God through Jesus. That's Acts 17. God had, This is a terrific text. Acts 17, 31. So, that God has appointed the day. It's on the calendar. Acts 17, 31. God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world through his son, who is a man, a man, not a God-man, but a man whom he's appointed for this job. That's Jesus, clearly. So as, it's rather sympathetic of God to use a human being, isn't it? So that might but God be... is presiding. God is he's presiding. He's on his throne, the fire, and of course. all this. He's the ultimate judge. I was going to say, yeah. might this explain why Jesus in Revelation looks like the Ancient of Days? Yeah. He becomes sure. the judge at that point? Yeah. Well, so the yeah. Yahweh thing applied to this? Well, thing? sure. And lots of texts that do that. He's certainly Jesus is like Yahweh. There are the Yahweh texts that are applied to Jesus all over the place. Jesus looks like this and, and angels show up. They have flashing eyes and faces too. Right. Immortal beings are terrifying when you meet them. So it applies well yeah, to... Yeah, it all them. reflects... The one God, oh, of course, absolutely. But this is Judgment Day, isn't it, that we face. As we get up in the morning, yeah. Judgment Day is coming. The words of Jesus, as you said rightly, is supervised by the ultimate judge, who is the Ancient of Days. And this is Ezekiel stuff, isn't it? The river of fire, all of that is reproduced. In, in uh, by the way, I like some paraphrases yes. where they have Ancient of Days. Yeah. Uh, one who had been living forever. Good. That's the T-E-D. Good. And the eternal God, which goes so, back to yep. the name. Of course, the eternal the, God. On, the, right. the one, who one is. being. The, exactly. The, the one who is and will be the only one who has immortality. That's in First Timothy 6. There, God the Father is the only one who has immortality innately. 
Jesus has immortality by gift. Holy angels are immortal. We know that. But God the Father is the only one who has... I mean, that's really something, isn't it? What does that all mean? I have no idea. And God will explain that to us. He's always had so, immortality. When it talks about that, that to him, whoever comes, we will be able to sit, we will sit on the thrones with, yes. with God, with yes. Jesus. Because yes. it says your thrones. Yes. You, know, you picture like a judge or a mm -hmm. king or whatever. There's a throne. Mm -hmm. Maybe his wife's next to him. Because mm -hmm. the queen, he but this is thrones, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll have a seat right up there. Absolutely. We have thrones too. The mm -hmm. plural is important. We're going to get to the yeah. explanation, which is exactly what you said there. Well, we heard yesterday, there you go, thrones. So there's more than one in God. Because <laughs> oh, 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 yes. <laughs> we heard you know, it all yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it but, has uh, wheels. I like that. Uh, isn't that marvelous? So you, you, wheels you, of burning yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Those who have an artistic streak will understand that better than I do. Verse 11, then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words. There's that 11th one alongside the 10, right? The Antichrist. I kept looking until the beast. He's called the beast there, probably. See, this final Antichrist is called a beast. The fourth kingdom is called a beast too, but the one who represents it is also a beast. That's very Hebraic. You have to handle both things. The single Antichrist turns out to be the beast, and it's also that final wicked kingdom. And that beast is going to get slain. That takes you to Revelation 20, where it says that the beast and the false prophet, prophet I'll just refer to it without turning to it, the beast and the false prophet at the end of Revelation uh, 20, I'll go 19, chapter 19, the end there, they, go, they are going to be thrown alive into the lake of fire. The rest of the wicked people are killed, executed before being thrown in the lake of fire. But these two guys, the beast and his false prophet, the PR man, I think is one of the leading preachers says, that his PR man, the false prophet, the FP, those two get to be thrown alive into the lake of fire. He said his body was destroyed yeah. and given to the burning camp. Absolutely. And that's but what will happen. doesn't sound alive. Mm -hmm. No, he's, thrown, he's alive when he's thrown in. And then he's destroyed. At that, well, let's turn over there. It, it makes a, a, that distinction in Revelation 19. Just so one says his body was destroyed and given to the fire. Meaning, his body was destroyed by the fire. I suppose. I, I suppose. Fire. That, yeah, the, well, the fire, distinction. Fire destroyed. Yeah, fire is destructive, right. apparently. 19th of Revelation, which is 19, a good place. 19 the verse. Was captured with the false prophet. 20. Uh, verse 19 says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Those would be the 10 and the 1, right? The 10 plus the 11. And their armies assembled to make war against the arise, arriving Messiah sitting on the throne, on the horse. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs. He's the miracle-working miracle one who gets an audience for the beast. Performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped his image. And these two, as to say these two individuals, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive. In Luke it says that the wicked will be executed. Bring them here and execute them in my presence. And then they could be thrown into a lake of fire, the trash place, you know. But these two are especially punished. Anyway, there it is. And then comes the kingdom and all of that is going to be get, getting very easy for you now after we get through this awful stuff. Verse 11, I kept looking, the sound of the verse for one, he gets slain. That's what we just looked at. As for the rest of the beasts, the ones who perhaps still are arising in the Middle East, that's the scene, that they're in process whenever, no chronology known to me at all, their dominion is taken away, but they're given an extension of life. What that means, I don't know. They're somehow, if they repent, some of them are allowed to survive, maybe into the kingdom time as possible. I have to wait and see. But now it gets to be much easier, if any of this has been puzzling. Who has verse 13? I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, mm -hmm. and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. Yes. 14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Yes. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, that shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And there you will say, hallelujah, I get it. 
Now it's beginning to make sense, right? The end of the story is where you sometimes go when you read books, right? How does it turn out? It turns out that the saints get the kingdom and the Son of Man is clearly Jesus and those who go with him. And as we mentioned yesterday, 84 times in the Gospels, Jesus says, I am the Son of Man. I'm the human being. So the Bible, you tell your friends, is all about God and man. Not about God and God, much less about God and God and God. It's about God and the amazing thing God can do with a sinless human being. That's fun, isn't it? If God wants to do that, he creates this amazing person, Adam, who failed dismally. Then he says, okay, let's, let's, let's do type 2, Mark 2, right? It's Jesus, sinless son. If he's not human, the whole story is pointless. Is that a question here? Yes, or? what have we got? Is Daniel 7, 13, 14 describing the same scene in heaven as Revelation 5, 8, 9? I would think so, yes. Uh, well, this is at the second coming. In Revelation 5, oh. 4 and 5 is actually not the second coming. We're just looking at the glory of God as he is now and the glory of Messiah sitting at the right hand. So that's current. This here is looking to the time when the dominion is given fully to Jesus. All what people. Jeremiah thirty twenty one. What does that say? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> While somebody looks that up, please. Jeremiah right. thirty twenty one. Yeah. Uh, the beast, if the beasts come out of the sea at the same time yeah. and exist together, yeah. how can they be the same as in Daniel two? Um, I, I don't think, and that's the point I raised. Probably in chapter seven they come out at the same time. Therefore, they couldn't be the same as chapter two, okay. if that's right. So chapter two would be more of a sequence in chapter seven, and that one would be four kingdoms existing contemporaneously in the Middle East. That, that's entirely possible. Jeremiah 30, uh, their children will be as in days of old, their yeah. community will be established before me, I will right. punish all who oppress them. Yeah. Verse 21, their leader will be one of their own, yes. their ruler will, will arise from among them, of I will bring him near and he will, he will come close okay. to me, mm -hmm. for who is he who will devote himself mm -hmm. to be close to me? Right. And that is Messiah and all the people that go with Messiah who are God's human instruments to arrange this beautiful kingdom. So that's good stuff. So 84 times in the Gospels Jesus said, I'm the Son of Man. Constantly he says, I'm the one sitting at the right hand and we make this Adonai point. He's the Lord, little L. He's the Adonai at the right hand of the Father. The human being and God. God and not God deity and not deity. We were taught in former days that there were two gods in the God family. That was atrociously wrong. So that's easy. So anyway, this whole what else? vision of, of yes. God and at the thrones and everything yes. and all the myriads. Mm. So everybody up there, yes. um, of course I don't know about the court, the myriads and myriads standing before him with the court and without. That's after the resurrection then? Yeah, it would apply before, certainly yeah. to, yes, the future. The, the judgment has not taken place. That's Acts 17. God has set a date on the calendar when he's going to judge the world. That would include the first resurrection. We, we get to be judged too and rewarded for what we do. And then, as we know, the second resurrection of all the rest of the dead, Revelation 20, verse 5. So that would cover the entire business of future judgment. Specifically here, the Son of Man is going to get yeah. the kingdom, and that's at the second. So when it's talking in verse 13 about the Son of Man coming, yes. coming, coming up to the Ancient of yes. Days, being presented to him, he's pretty much the only person he is. up there. Absolutely. Everybody else at this time, right. at this presentation right. of Jesus, is that's the right. only person that's, that's ever point. been a human right. that's up there. There's Liberal scholars love there. this because they don't like the second coming, and, and strictly speaking, they're right. This is the Son of Man going up to God. And he's given all of this authority. Then, of course, we know he comes back to exercise it. That's the part the liberal scholars don't like at all. But right, he's coming to the Father, presumably at his ascension, when he's super elevated, and he gets, in promise at least, not yet executing it all, glory, dominion, and kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar had all that. All that awful kingdom that went so wrong is a type of worldwide government, and this Messiah is going to get it right that all the nations, languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, will not pass away in his kingdom. This is the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Everybody knew that. When Jesus came into Galilee saying, wake up, the kingdom of God is coming, they knew what that was. It meant this scene. They knew that. It's like you know what the constitution is. 
Unfortunately, it's been so garbled, you know, by going to heaven when you die, and it's so muddled people don't know it. But the kingdom is this kingdom, clearly, firstly. We're not going to have time to do the rest of it, unfortunately, because we're <clears throat> running out of time. But the rest of it is, is going to be very much easier, in a way. You're going to see more of the same. You get the kingdom, just, just point to 18, the verses that you stress with your friends, 18 and 22 and 27. I'm going to read those as a preview. 18 says, The saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom. So the Son of Man gets it, and all the group with him get the kingdom. They receive and they possess the kingdom. That's blessed are the meek. They're going to possess the earth, not inherit it. Exactly, it is inherit, but better possess the earth, getting it straight from here. Then in 22, until the ancient days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints, God says, you're the ones who are going to rule the world and uh, saints of the highest one. And the time arrived, I, I like that. It isn't timeless, spaceless nonsense, you see. Plato loves that. The time comes, on your clock, on your calendar, the time actually comes when the saints took possession. That's Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, they're going to possess the kingdom. And the devil has done away with much of that by saying, no, the real object is when you die, you go off to heaven and play off and pink out. I've destroyed the story. You are the ones that get the story going, right? You, you do the narrative, to use the Fox News image. You get the narrative. The saints took possession. You're not possessing the kingdom now. Paul says, don't imagine you're ruling the world now. Don't imagine it. You're not. Paul says, I don't need no place to stay. I'm beaten around and I'm kicked from pillar to post. Nobody likes me. He's not a king. You think you're kings and priests. You had to tell them in 1 Corinthians 4. Dan and I will be doing this. Make this big point. They thought they were kings and priests. Now you are not. Don't kid yourself. When you're a king and a priest, you are going to have authority over the world. So finally in 27, then the sovereignty and the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven, you have to say to your JW friends, because they're all off in heaven with Jesus, 144,000 are, ah, that's all wrong. No, under the whole heaven, all of that kingdom is given to the people of the saints. You're the saints. The JWs all don't know that. They don't believe it. They don't think they're sin. They don't think they're body of Christ. They don't think they have the spirit. They're just all so ranks. You've got to change all that. There's only 10 million. Let's go for them. Get them straightened out. You get the kingdom here under the whole heaven. And strictly speaking, it reads at the end, all nations are going to serve and obey them, the saints. Oh, translators don't like that too much. It's a better way to read. This is quite something, isn't it? Uh, well, that goes with verse 14, that all the people's nations and everyone might like, serve him. Absolutely. Because this, this is talking about peoples and nations yes. and languages, so these are not people that are up there no. at the throne of God. No. These are people on the earth exactly. that lived through all Absolutely. the return of Christ, sure. where the, the saints have already been made... Yep. And you're right to point to 14. We can also point to chapter, uh, verse 22. So you yes, do 14, yeah, 22. Both of those the time came when the saints get the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. And then. But they're not the only ones in the kingdom. They're the rulers of the yeah, kingdom of because there's still going to be That's peoples right. and nations Absolutely. that we're going to be rulers That's over. Right. We have to always make that clear because it's I know. very unclear to a lot of people. It is. And people say, well, who are we going to rule over? Right. You well, you simply quote. Uh, Revelation 2, 26, 27, that's the key verse. Revelation 2, 26, 27, Jesus said, If you overcome, I will give you, Revelation 2, 26, 27, I will give you power over the nations to shatter them like earthenware. Just as God gave me that power. So you say to people, do you want to be like Jesus? Oh yes, I want to, I want to be like Jesus. But what would Jesus do? Good, great. How about ruling the world with a rod of iron? Oh, no, poor little mate, no, no. If I can just hold the door. I'm tired of that. Because it confronts God, you see. It says, oh God, you cannot do what you say you're going to do. I, I'm not, you know, I'm, who are me? I'm nothing. Well, okay. How about God, God says, take charge of five cities? I've heard that misquoted. We had somebody say, take part in five cities. Came out of his mouth. He hasn't understood it. We tried to help him see that. It's a great truth here, isn't it? If it's wrong, show us, but it's easy stuff, really. Okay, you're right though. You have to stress. You have to make sure people understand it's not, it's not, I don't want to say just because that makes right. it downplay us, right, right, the saints. Right. It's not just the saints, no. and which would be this more yeah. like an ethereal, supernatural right, place. Right. There's going to be physical Absolutely. people still Cities. on this earth. Absolutely. Yeah. If they will not keep the Feast of Tabernacles, they're not going to do rain. How about I that? I have to read the whole Bible. 
Okay. At, least, at least Isaiah. Absolutely. The whole of Isaiah, you can do it in two sittings, read 39 verses and chapters, and then the rest of the book. It's fascinating material, because it's your life and your destiny. Your do you have a good booklet that you can tell people about, um, about no. the kingdom, and as far well, as anybody would? The, the book we did on the kingdom, it's in 14 languages now, Coming Kingdom of the Messiah, best I can do. Well, just to tell people in case they don't. Right, uh, we, uh, it's free at our, at our side. The coming kingdom of the Messiah, a, I call it a solution to the riddle of the New Testament. There was a so somebody, Hoskins, who wrote a book called The Riddle of the New Testament. So I thought, let's do a solution to the riddle <laughs> of the New Testament and that's called The Coming Kingdom of the Messiah. And then in my translation, the One God, One Man Messiah translation, copious notes all through with this, I think, an easy theme, actually, isn't it? And isn't it what we really all want? How about making America great? <laughs> How about making the world great? <laughs> How about being able to say to somebody, put that gun down, don't you dare imagine killing a baby in the womb first. Don't even go there. Let's not have sex outside of marriage. You're going to enforce those rules. That's going to make the world great, isn't it? I think this is an easy theme, but it makes a lot of sense to me. If it's wrong, the Bible is frankly false, and I'm not prepared to believe that. Can I say one more thing? Keep yeah, going. please, go on. That, that I love this whole description, I keep going back to this description of, <clears throat> of God being white as snow, his clothes, yes. his vestures, his clothing, yes. his hair, it's all, everything is sort of white and light and bright, as opposed to, you look at all the ISIS people yes. now, and all, they're all bandaged from head to toe and black, black, black. <laughs> it's just so black and dark. And then this is a vision of lightness and whiteness. And you come full very, circle back to Dan, yes, right? Very, you walk in the light. light. Yes. Yes. And so we're worried about people who wear black. Oh, is that one we're going to wear? No, I mean, you can wear black clothes. <laughs> you can. I'm not sure. <laughs> Several of us here have black clothing on today. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we shouldn't have but another your rule. Your head isn't bandaged in it. You're not happy with the black flag. And the, you can know. you shake hands? With a, with, if you're yes. a female, can you shake hands with a male? <laughs> that would be a triumph. This dear lady, she was so nice. She was so sweet. Nice to talk to her. Come, to Come on. Get a part of me. Say, get a life. Get a life. You know, have a life. Can't do that yet, but... So, some said on life... What else? Anything oh, else? That, that, what he keeps saying, get yeah. a life. Yes, uh, uh, someone said... Uh, I'm about to get a life. Uh, it was somewhere, I swear. Oh, you're about to get a life. It was, yeah, it was funny, wasn't it? Did you see? Uh, what he said was that they... He said, get a life, and Dennis Baldwin, he said, but they have a life, and it's miserable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they have one, unfortunately. No, we shouldn't. And they're yeah. miserable, something like that. Yeah. Also, there was the other person that said something, and I wanted to get back to yeah. it. Because it was just a longer... Who was it? Because it just... My, my, uh, the term, my grace is sufficient. Yes. I thought that yes. required more than just a little one-sentence explanation right, uh, if they wanted. Yeah. Jesus says to Paul, is that yeah. Thorny the first? That's right. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, he it's begged a, God to remove it, and God did not. Here, wanting to know what, right. what does right. that mean by my grace? Oh, well, it's, Paul is complaining. He says, I've got all these problems. I've sleepless nights, you know, two or three days in the ocean, nowhere to stay. I'm being kicked from pillar to Everybody hates me. They detest my guts. They finally crucified him. You know that. Killed him, not crucified him. They chopped his head off. He knew that. Nero could not stand Paul. I can understand that too. So they chopped his head off. All the apostles, I read this this week on the internet, all the apostles probably were murdered. All of them. One of them upside down. Peter, uh, uh, there's one that wasn't... Uh, uh, John, John, probably not. John not. John was banished probably to Patmos. He died of old age, ostensibly. Peter was crucified upside down. How would you like that? Isaiah was cut in half with a saw. The tradition is that Manasseh, the evil king, sawed him in half. So the reward for that is you're going to get your time of success, and that's what we're reading about there. Actually, it's a, it's a marvelous drama, isn't it? Isn't, yeah. isn't that a marvelous drama? Just to quote the, I pleaded with the Lord three yes. times. Here you go. We are seeing with the Lord Jesus yes. to get rid of his problem, mm -hmm. whatever, the thorn in the yep. flesh. Verse 9, but he told me, my grace is all you will need, mm -hmm. for my power is effective in, in weakness. weakness. Isn't that great? Okay, that's good. That's one thing. 
the Lord Jesus, Lord God, it doesn't matter, he's talking to God so and Jesus. My grace, all is all you need. Uh, my grace is sufficient for you. I will not test you beyond what you can take. My grace is enough. And he probably had an eyesight problem because he said in Galatians, you loved me so much when I visited you, you if, if you could have done it, you'd have plucked out your eyes and given me, because he, he couldn't read well, perhaps. Whatever that was. We'll find out. There are so many questions at the Messianic Banquet, and you get to sit opposite Paul, and say, by the way, what did you mean when you said that? <laughs> Hope it's not too late. Yeah. Okay. you have a song for us? Ramon says, thanks, everyone. Sometimes doubt comes in because of oh. what we hear in church. Oh, yeah. Have more faith, and God will do it. Yes, and we, as 